we can hear you, Victor. The mic. You are muted. I had unmuted it. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, yes. Good morning, then, and good afternoon to all those of you who have been with us in the previous sessions and to those that are joining us today for the first time. I'm very happy to welcome you all to the third session of Constellations of the Ordinary, a colloquium in memory and homage of Stanley Cavell's life and work. It has been rather an unexpected synchronicity that in our first sessions, including today's, both speakers have happened to touch on the same topic from an ordinary language philosophical perspective, even if from slightly different directions. Avner Bas and Byron Davies, for example, in our first session touched on the question of the world. Avner from the perspective of a critique of analytic philosophy's conception of language meaning, and Byron in terms of how our present day fragmented words also can find a place in Stanley's theory of film. In our second session, Toro Moy talked about uh, philosophical criticism, which he called a Wittgensteinian phenomenology of criticism. And, and Stephen Affelt actually performed one such criticism, putting together film and philosophy with regard to Stanley's last book, his autobiography, Little Did I Know. And today, our speakers are both, again, synchronistically talking about a central issue in Cavell's thought, namely skepticism. As you may have noticed in the opening banner, Stanley's quote serves as an opening to the issues we will be dealing with today. And I quote, that the familiar is a product of a sense of the unfamiliar and of the sense of a return means that what returns after skepticism is never just the same. That the familiar is a product of a sense of the unfamiliar and of the sense of a return means that what returns after skepticism if ne is never just the same. I think it very nicely summarizes, I think, the, the concerns behind both presentations, as I hope we will see. Now, we have two wonderful papers today, and I'm delighted to introduce two very special Cavellian friends, Jonadas Tecchio and Nicholas Toivakainen. We will start today with Jonadas, who teaches at the Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul in Brazil, and who has made of ordinary language philosophy, Cavell, and film the heart of his work. He has published Anti-Individualism, Self-Knowledge and Responsibility in 2010, Skepticism and Finitude, Notes on the Philosophy of Stanley Cavell in 2012, Cinema and Philosophy, Why, How, Where in 2013, and just recently in 2020, a collection of essays entitled The Threat of Solipsism, Wittgenstein and Cavell on Meaning, Skepticism, and Finitude. I leave with you then, Jonas Tecchio, who will be talking about his paper, Responding to Skepticism, the Legacies of Austin, Clark, and Cavell. Jonas, please. Thank you, Victor. Hi, everybody. Uh, I, I thought these connections between the topics were by design, not synchronicity. So I'm surprised to hear that. <laughs> uh, so as Victor told you, the, the title of my paper is Responding to Skepticism, the Legacies of Austin, Clark, and Cavell. And I, I would like to start with a word about this idea of responding. Uh, my intuition that I try to explore in the paper is that there is something in common between Austin, among Austin, Clark, and Cavell, which has to do with their strategy. Uh, they do not try to answer the skeptical challenges, which would assume that they make sense or make clear sense. They rather try to uh, ask whether the, the questions that the skeptic raises can be meant, and if so, what can be their meaning. So this is what I the, the distinction between responding and answering that I am assuming. But there's also differences among their treatments of skepticism. And I'm trying in this paper to clarify those similarities and differences. One difference that is of particular interest to me has to do with the way each of them understands the relation between the ordinary and the philosophical. They don't even use the same words. They use different words to express this that difference, and I think that's part of what is in, in interesting to, to understand. Um, and I think studying skepticism is a good way to, to tackle that particular uh, aspect of their philosophies, the relation between the ordinary and the philosophical. 
I thought for this occasion, since this is an event about Cavell, I would start a little differently from what I did in the paper, um, recalling some autobiographical remarks that Cavell made in the foreword to the Claim of Reason, and later he uh, gave more detail about that in his autobiography. And he presents in the Claim of Reason what he we could think as a double shock caused by Austin and by Clark. Uh, I quote a passage from the foreword, it's in the first page. In 1955, Austin came to Harvard to give as the William James lectures his work on performative utterances and a graduate seminar on excuses. This material together with the procedures inspiring them knocked me off my horse. So this is the first shock. Cavell says that he was in the middle of writing his PhD dissertation on action. And then Austin came, gave those lectures, and his procedures, his way of appealing to what we ordinarily say, changed his view of philosophy forever. So he had to go back and start again. And then a page later, he says, I quote again, the shock was doubled by Thompson Clark's ability to accept and absorb those procedures. He's talking about the procedures of ordinary language philosophy, almost completely within rather than against the procedures of traditional epistemology. So as you know, Austin uses those procedures to criticize traditional epistemology. And the shock with Clark was that those same procedures could be used in defense, or in partial defense at least, of the procedures of traditional epistemology. So there, is two sh there are two shocks. And I take it, this is my way of understanding the situation, that Cavell started uh, his, um, his work with a brand of ordinary language philosophy that he inherited from Austin. And I think that is well uh, recorded in his first essay, In Must We Mean What We Say. He's basically using those procedures for a specific problem there. But then after the shock, the second shock caused by Clark, he had to go back and rethink ordinary language philosophy. And, and to, as he says at some point, he had to take steps backward backwards before he could, moving, could move on again. And I think the way he found to move forward was basically by reading Wittgenstein's investigation. So we have here Austin Clark and Wittgenstein as the main inspirations for the claim of reason. And he did that, I think, particularly by understanding the importance of the style or the method of the investigations, the way the work is written. Uh, in which Wittgenstein creates a kind of dialectic with different voices in a conversation. And Cavell talks about those voices as the voice of correction, the voice of temptation. And I think a lesson Cavell learned from Wittgenstein is that it is fundamental to try to get inside the perspective of the philosopher, whoever that may be, mostly it's ourselves, and to give voice to the fantasies and temptations of that philosophy before trying to, uh, you know, to cure it or to, to offer a, a diagnosis of its sources in a less dogmatic way than, for example, Austin did. Uh, so I think this is basically what Cavell realized Austin failed to do. Austin failed to try to get inside the, for example, the skeptic's perspective. He, he was a little too dogmatic in his appeal to ordinary language. Clark, on the other hand, tried to give voice to the skeptic, tried to get inside his perspective, but he used a therapeutic strategy to point the problems with the skeptic, skeptical position that, as I, I put at some point in my paper, was too wholesale in, in Cavell's view, a, a more this meal procedure would be better. And I'll try to clarify what I mean by this in what follows. So what I will do uh, here is I, I will be very brief about Austin, a little less brief about uh, Clark, and try to give more space to talk about Cavell, since this is a 
conference about Cavell. But of course, if you have questions about those other parts of the paper, I will be happy to, to answer them. So I have three sections on the paper and here too, one on Austin, one on Clark and one on Cavell. About Austin, I just would like to remind everybody that especially in the other minds essay, there is an opposition between common sense on the one hand and on the other hand, epistemology, philosophy, metaphysics. Those are words that uh, Austin uses to, to, to describe the, the opponent of common sense. And for Austin, common sense is in no need of philosophical defense. Actually, defending common sense philosophically would be already accepting too much of the skeptical position, in a sense. It's already buying to the skeptical way of presenting the problem. Instead, Austin defends that we should avoid the skeptical questions, show that they cannot be raised in some sense, that there are problems with the skeptical questions and we do not need to respond to them. Uh, in the paper, I use the famous Goldfinch uh, example. There is a dialogue that, uh, among others, that Austin presents. I present a claim to know. This is there is a goldfinch in my garden. An interlocutor, interlocutor poses a skeptical challenge. How do you know it's a goldfinch? I offer a basis for that claim. For example, by its red head. The interlocutor replies, "Well, it could be a gold crest. They also have red heads." And the Conclusion could be, well, then I don't know it is a goldfinch, right? That could end the dialogue. But imagine that the dialogue were to continue and I say I give a better basis for my claim. I say that, you know, there is something about the sound the bird makes, the way he be it behaves and so forth. And then the interlocutor in this imaginary dialogue would offer a new challenge and he would say, well, but you know, you could be dreaming, you could be uh, hallucinating, it could be uh, a, a fake bird and, and things like that. And so Austin wants to remind us that this is, uh, this is not how an ordinary exchange would go. That uh, I quote him, enough is enough. Enough means enough to show within reason and for present purposes and intents that it can't be anything else. There is no room for an alternative, competing description of it. It doesn't mean, for example, enough to show that it isn't a stuffed goldfinch. So this is an example that, but the, the moral here is that Austin's procedures amount to ways of reminding us of what we say in ordinary context and showing that we can avoid skeptical questions as nonsense or at, as he uh, prefers to say, as silly and outrageous. So there is a sense in which we do not need to take seriously the skeptical challenge in, in this interlock, the, the second version of this dialogue. This is what I have to say about, about Austin, just this short reminder. So about Clark. Clark, I think, takes one additional step back relative to Austin. Austin is already asking about the, the sense of the skeptical question. And Clark, in his paper, The Legacy of Skepticism, published in 1972, asks a twofold question which has to do with the target of skeptical challenges. The question is, I quote, what is the skeptic examining? Our most fundamental beliefs or the product of a large piece of philosophizing about empirical knowledge done before he comes to stage? And what would his reflections proper, properly construed reveal? So Clark is, and I think the answer that Clark will eventually give to the first question is that the skeptic is already examine, examining something that is a philosophical invention, so to speak. But I'll, I'll get there. I think Clark has a different way of delineating the topology of the logical space, distinguishing the ordinary and the philosophical when compared to Austin. The words that, that Clark uses to, to make a similar distinction is the plain versus the philosophical. The plain is defined as basically an engaged perspective, a perspective from inside our 
various practices, perhaps language games in between science sense, including scientific practices, for example. So on the one hand, the plain, and on the other hand, the pure or the philosophical, which imply, implies stepping back from inside the circle of the plane, as he says, making general claims, general questions, asking general questions about what we know, for example. On Clark's picture, the philosopher, perhaps just wishing to describe or even to defend our ordinary beliefs, says some things about the plane as a whole that the skeptic then realizes raises pro raise problems. So it's not the skeptic who is in, you know, inventing the problems, the philosopher, even if he, a philosopher who tries to defend common sense asks and try to answer general questions. I think Moore is the main example, but uh, with Austin, I think in a sense could be uh, also part of the target here. Uh, and so for Clark, an effort to understand the problems that the skeptic raises from inside his or her perspective will be helpful, even if that perspective shows ultimately to be confused. And that's the, the idea of the legacy of skepticism. We can learn something even if there is a confusion in skepticism, something about the ordinary and the philosophical. One way to flesh out the perspective of the skeptic that uh, Clark uses in the paper is an analogy with some aviators that are taught how to spot different kinds of enemy planes. They, they have some criteria to distinguish five kinds of enemy, enemy planes, planes, sorry. Uh, so there are some, a list of features that plane A, B, C, D, E have, and that's all they know, they, they can, uh, identify those five planes, but there are three other older versions of those planes that do not offer the same level of risk. And they are similar to those ones. So for practical reasons, they do, they do not need to identify those other three. They only have criteria for the five first ones. And they will sometimes say that uh, uh, an old plane is, for example, plane A, when there are some differences between them. But for practical, practical purposes, their identification, it's fine. It, it's enough for their uh, interest for, for defending from the enemy planes, for example. Um, so there is a sense in which the criteria for identification of these plane spotters are restricted. They are not designed to make finer distinctions that would be needed to encompass all the possible cases. The result seems to be that those spotters do not really know whether a given plane is of kind A, B, or C, for example. He doesn't really know because it could be one of the older ones. So, but they know in scare quotes for, for practical purposes, and that's enough. But there is a pure sense of knowing in, in, in that pure sense that I could um, reject any alternative they do not know. So the analogy is used by Clark to show us what the skeptic thinks about our ordinary criteria. He thinks that our ordinary concepts are similar to these concepts in this thought experiment. We say we know a lot of things, but that is knowing in, in that scare quote sense. You know, it's, it's knowing for practical purposes. But really, we do not, for example, know whether we are dreaming or not, to take the Descartes example, because we cannot exclude the possibility that we are dreaming. We, for practical purposes, do those, those distinctions, and that's OK. But in a philosophical, pure sense, we do not know now that we are not dreaming. So from the skeptical perspective, our uh, condition, our ordinary condition, is restricted. And that's the problem that he sees. Um, so the problem with the skeptic, the skeptic is not exactly that he is asking questions that are meaningless given our ordinary requirements of intelligibility, as Austin would have it, but rather that he assumes a problematic view of our conceptual human constitution, as Clark said in which concepts have something like an intrinsic meaning or content that is independent of our practices and uses. 
However, such a view is not an invention of the skeptic. It is a result, again, to quote uh, that uh, sentence, of a large piece of philosophizing that takes place before he comes to stage. So the legacy of skepticism understood from the inside, as Clark tries to do, is to open a field of investigation about a correct theory of our conceptual constitution. What could be a better version of the way our concepts work that avoid this kind of skeptical view that our use is restricted? And this is a task that Clark's paper leaves open. It doesn't address. And I take it that this is one of the central tasks that Cavell sets out to accomplish in the claim of reason. And this is my cue to go to the, the last section. So I think Cavell agrees with Clark that Austin's response to skepticism is not sufficient. That there is something missing. Austin doesn't even try to get inside the skeptical perspective. But he disagrees with Clark in thinking that there is something deeply right about Austin's idea that when I say something, there must be a point to my saying it. There must be a way of assessing whether I'm right or wrong. And this sense of what to say when is the only ground that can be used to assess the meaning of, of any kind of claim, including the skeptical claims. In this sense, I think Avel wants to use insights, insights from both Austin and Clark in order to present a more nuanced diagnosis of the sources and shortcomings of skepticism. And for that, he needs a new version of ordinary language philosophy. Cavell starts doing that, or at least this is the way I present in the paper, by criticizing a philosophical fixation with the notion of the meaning of words or sentences in isolation, what the words mean by themselves. Inspired by Wittgenstein's view of the meaning as use, to take a, you know, a shorthand here, Cavell wants to show that the meaning of our words by themselves is a mere abstraction, something that depends upon what we mean, each of us, specifically in a specific context. What is the point of our claims? So we have to mean what we say, not the words have meaning only in a kind of secondary sense. The words have meaning in themselves in a secondary sense. <clears throat> Cavell diagnosis, Cavell's diagnosis will be ultimately that the skeptic is not meaning anything determinate with his or her hers words. On the face of it, this sounds exactly like Clark's conclusion, but there is an important difference, which is, I think, also a, a, a difficult difference to. to to make clear, so I'm trying my best here. I think Clark mounts his criticism by distinguishing between two domains of meaning, of meaning, the plain and the philosophical, and showing that the skeptic has one foot in the plain and one foot in the philosophical. This is his way of presenting it. So in a sense, it's as if the, the skeptic is trying to play two games at the same time, and he doesn't notice that, and that's the problem. He could, in principle, play some other game. But the problem is that he is, has one foot in each of those games, so to speak, metaphorically. Cavell, on the other hand, distinguishes between, not between two games, but between ways of meaning words and merely apparent ways of meaning words. So on the first side, ways, ways of meaning words, there are you know, there's a myriad of language games. All the language games that we play and some that we didn't play yet, but we will play. All of those are ways of using words in potentially with meaning and with a point. But there are some hallucinations of meaning, Cavell says, so, some merely apparent ways of using words that have to do with what Wittgenstein calls language going in a holiday, or Cavell also says, speaking outside of any language game. So we use words that sound like words that have a role in language games, but they are not being used by that person in that particular context to make a determinate point. So the distinction is slightly different between what makes sense, what is meaningful, and what is meaningless. 
And this is the reason why I think Cavell's notion of the ordinary is not exactly the same as Clark's notion of the plane. Cavell doesn't conceive the ordinary as some kind of fixed structure or domain, but rather as a kind of moving target. This is the expression I use to try to make sense of this. And I may, I may be wrong, but it's uh, the way I see it. So not a fixed structure, but a moving target, something toward which we are continuously striving in our attempts to find and nurture mutual agree attunement, which eventually becomes expressed by our shared judgments and shared concepts and, and criteria. Uh, since in this view, the ordinary is conceived as a dynamic background against which our language games are developed and played, it is normally not thematized. Hence, it is not readily apparent even to masters of the language. Rather, the ordinary shows up precisely under the pressure of philosophy, understood as this temptation to speak outside language games. Thus, it is only in the interplay between philosophical temptations and attempts at bringing our words back to the ordinary that will enable the kind of elucidation sought for by Cavell which finally takes me to the distinction between wholesale and piecemeal approaches in philosophy. I'm, I'm approaching the conclusion here. As I read Cavell, no wholesale refutation of skepticism is available for the ordinary language philosopher. The only way to measure the extent of our agreement in forms of life is to put it to test, staking one's claims in search of acknowledgement and thus exposing oneself precisely to the kind of repudiation whose standing possibility so impresses the skeptic. The truth in skepticism has to do with this fact, that the ordinary is indeed vulnerable and unstable. Hence, in some philosophical moods, disappointing. Our challenge is to accept this vulnerability and this instability, trying to make them habitable as opposed to despairing of them as the skeptic to a great extent unknowingly does, assuming a fantasy in which we can forego our own responsibility in achieving shared judgments inside this changeable and dynamic horizon. And this is just a paragraph with my conclusions now. Uh, so in conclusion, I think Austin pictures the domain of the ordinary or the common sense in his words, as immune for, from philosophical motivated skeptical attacks, which are in turn seen as simply silly or outrageous. Differently from Austin, Thomson Clark does not think the concerns of tradition intelligible from the start. They might well prove to be not fully intelligible in the end but studying them carefully opens up a whole field of investigation concerning the structure of the plane and its relation to the philosophical. And this is the legacy of skepticism in his view. Stanley Cavell agrees that studying skepticism is the key to elucidate the logic of the ordinary, but for reasons that are subtly, subtly yet importantly different from Clark's. Namely, the ordinary is not a fixed domain, but rather a largely non-thematized and constantly evolving horizon of meaning. And it is under the pressure of philosophical attempts to speak outside language games that we will become aware of those boundaries, the dynamic boundaries of, this, of the ordinary. In this respect, Cavell is closer to Austin than to Clark in vindicating the procedures of the ordinary language philosopher and her reliance on her own sense of what to say when. Um, as to the as being the only way of elucidating the meaning of our words and concepts. However, contra Austin, and possibly closer to Clark, Cavell doesn't think that it is silly or outrageous to try to go beyond our ordinary language games. On the contrary, nothing is more human than the wish to deny our finitude and its burden. And that's my conclusion. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jonadas. Bravo. Yes, and thank you for sticking to your time limits. I really appreciate that. 
Well, uh, before introducing our next speaker, I wanted to apologize to all those people who left their questions in the chat board last time for never being able to get to them. In order to avoid that this time, we are extending the open discussion at the end of Nicholas's presentation until 1.15 EST. We hope that this extension will allow us to have a richer and more inclusive discussion. Okay, it is my pleasure now to introduce Niklas Toivakainen, PhD from the University of Helsinki, whose interests include ethics, philosophy of mind, psychoanalysis, philosophy of science, technology, and culture. He is author of To Think for Oneself, Philosophy as the Unraveling of Moral Responsibility of 2017, Automation Technology in the, in the Dynamics of Modernity, an essay on technology, social organization, and existential concerns of 2018, and most recently also in 2020, Displacing Desire, an essay on the moral existential dynamics of the mind-body problem. Today, he will focus on the idea of return and its importance within the constellation of skepticism as conceived by Cabell and ordinary language uh, philosophy. So it is my pleasure to leave with you, Nicholas Tullvaikanen. All right, thank you, uh, Victor, for, for your introduction. Um, so I will be basically reading out uh, this paper, which I kind of exclusively wrote for, for this event. Uh, it's a very, uh, very dense uh, form of, uh, uh, or, or very dense paper, um, but I hope it's, it will at least uh, stimulate some discussions. All right. Um, in remark 106 uh, of Wittgenstein's philosophical investigations, we find uh, what Cavell would call the voice of correctness, proclaiming or reminding us that it is difficult, as it were, to keep our heads up, to see that we must stick to the subject of our everyday thinking and not go astray and imagine that we have described extreme subtleties. Philosophy, or rather philosophers, have, so the remark seems to indicate, tended to, do, tended to do exactly this, that is, go astray, living the everyday. And so the task of philosophy is, quote, to bring words back from the metaphysical to the everyday use, unquote. But what exactly does this mean? Does it mean that we have to, uh, does it mean that we would have been better off had we always stuck to the everyday? And does it mean that when we bring ourselves back to the everyday, we re-enter the same state or scene from which we once departed? Wittgenstein speaks of the results of philosophy being the uncovering of one uh, or another piece of non plain nonsense. And that the reason for the departure from the everyday had something to do with a failure to understand clearly our uses of words. In other words, the investigation seems to su suggest that philosophy does indeed or can yield results. And thus, and does this not imply then that these results would shed, as it were, a new light or transform our apprehension of the everyday to which we will be returning? Moreover, Wittgenstein speaks of our conceptual confusion as generated by pictures or grammatical fictions and illusions which hold us, hold us captive, but never indicates that this captivity is not already there, somehow inherent in the everyday. And although he speaks of these illusions as forcing themselves on us, or as bestowed with a bewitching character, he in other places speaks of them as generated by our, by our urge and our temptation to misunderstand, or by our tendency to be seduced into misunderstanding. Saying that we have an urge that we are tempted and seduced implies that misunderstanding is appealing to us. Our misunderstandings are, in other words, not simply in innocent intellectual mistakes, but as Cavell would note, we are ourselves intrinsically part of the very grammar that is so bewitching. We are ourselves in some way responsible for our confusion. For Wittgenstein, especially following Cavell's reading of him, the everyday or the ordinary is then our destiny, the place where we find the fixed point of our real need. It is exactly something for us to, uh, sorry, uh, but 
this is exactly something for us to find, something for us to acknowledge, something for us to achieve. And we achieve it only by returning to it. In other words, our own being as subjects is not, as it were, a given, or to use a Lacanian idiom, a real in itself, but rather something we become through an uh, intersubjective movement of departure and return. Now, in what follows, I will present some reflections on how to understand this movement. I shall say some things about how I see Cavell addressing and answering these questions, and I shall raise some possibly critical questions to Cavell in combination with shortly attempting to give my own view. I should also like to point out that my account of Cavell here is, uh, and specifically in relation to these questions, is helped here by Spendal's Cavell religion and continental philosophy. <clears throat> in contrast to some advocates of so-called ordinary language philosophy, Cavell is known for claiming that any appeal to ordinary language uh, cannot refute skepticism, nor ought it strive to do so. The reason for this is that skepticism involves a certain truth about our human condition, namely that the criteria of the meaningfulness of our language and of our lives comes to an end before, as it were, a final explanation or account has been settled. Instead of an axiomatic secure ground at the bottom of language, meaning and understanding, we reach instead a groundlessness, as Cavell calls it. So where explanations come to an end, there we find that this is simply what we do. Now this so-called groundlessness is manifest already in the opening remarks of the inve investigations, uh, the famous Augustinian picture of language. Now we'll just quickly read it out uh, to remind uh, those who, who have forgotten or never uh, read it before. So this is a quote from Augustine's Confessions and it reads, when they, that is my elders, named some object and accordingly moved towards something. I saw this and I grasped, grasped that the thing was called by the sound they uttered when they meant to point it out. The retentions were shown by their bodily movements as if it, as, uh, as it were the natural language of all peoples, the expression of the face, the play of the eyes, the movement of other parts of the body and the tone of the voice which expressed our state of mind in seeking, having, rejecting or avoiding something. Thus I heard words repeatedly used, uh, thus as I heard uh, words repeatedly used in their proper places in various sentences, I gradually learned to understand what objects they signified. And after I had trained my mouth to form these signs, I used them to express my own desires. Now in contrast to the axiomatic opening remark uh, of Wittgenstein's Tractatus, uh, that is, the world is everything that is the case, the quote from Augustine's Confessions sets rather a scene. So instead of an axiomatic simple, the investigations open with something already not simple, something composed or relational. Or the investigations place in something not simple, something already relational at the very point of origin. In fact, it seems to me quite appropriate to think of the quote of, uh, from Augustine's Confessions as an Ursen, both in terms of being the opening scene of the investigations itself, as well as a primal scene or mythology of language acquisition uh, and of meaning and of understanding also. Now I want to identify four elements at play in this opening scene, elements that are formative for the, for the whole landscape of the investigations and elements that, well, in a certain sense, depicted here as basic or even fundamental are all independent, interdependent one does not make sense without the other. <laughs> so to begin with, there is separateness. That is, there is the inner lives, the desires, intention, ideas, and so forth of individuals, of the child and of the parents. In short, there is individuality. Second, then there is the words, the rules of language that come from the other, from the language community. There is an already established use of words that, must, that one must learn to master. Third, this relation between the self and the other and all of the uh, latent risks and tensions would, however, be empty or impotent were it not for the desire to reach out to the other person, the desire to learn language by which to engage with the other person, the parent in this case, 
the desire to extend or enrich a communion with the other through language. And finally, as an inescapable feature of this scene, we find an already present understanding and sharing of significance between the infant and the parents. That is, were it not for an already existing understanding of the, quote, natural languages all, all of, of all peoples, of the expression of the face, the play of the eyes, the movements of the other parts of the body, and the tone of voice which expresses a state of mind in seeking, having, rejecting, or avoiding something. Were it not for these, language would not be at least what it is for us. The Augustinian picture of language, the Ursen of the investigations, give us then the seemingly peculiar picture of mythology that the very possibility of language, the very possibility of meaning and of understanding always already contains understanding and meaning. In order for language to function, in order for there, uh, there to be meaning and understanding, the parent and the child must already understand each other. They must, in other words, already be in a certain communing with, that, with each other, a communion out of which meaning and understanding will grow, yet always depend on. Now, despite the relentless attempts to find an exhaustive, simple explanation or account of the origins of meaning and understanding, the investigations continuously returns to the Uze. That is, instead of final explanations, the investigations offers us such idiosyncratic responses as, quote, if I have exhausted the justifications, I have reached bed the bedrock, I have reached bedrock, and my spade is turned. Then I am inclined to say, this is simply what I, what I do, unquote. Or, to imagine a language means to imagine a formal life, or furthermore, more, it is what human beings say that is true and false, and they agree in the language they use. That is not agreement in opinion, but in form of life. In other words, in some inexplicable and basic sense, we simply just seem to understand each other. It is then because of the Ursen of language and meaning, it is then because the Ursen of language and meaning seem to presuppose an already uh, present communion that can, Cavell will say that instead of finding secure knowledge at the core of sense of the sense of our lives and of the world, we find that uh, this sense is tied to us and we to ourselves and to others and to the world only by the ordinary uh, yet simultaneously extraordinary vulnerable thread of acknowledgement. As Cavell notes, quote, it is, a uh, it is a vision as simple as it is difficult and as difficult as it is, and because it is terrifying. <clears throat> Importantly then, in its, let us call it pre-reflective state, the ordinary, ordinary does not include this vision of itself, of its own condition. Fully merged with the ordinary, if there ever was such a thing, the individuals themselves cannot inhabit it. As Espendal puts it, echoing Cavell, it is only insofar as we realize that our common in intelligibility and the meaningfulness of the world can be lost that we know that what it means to inhabit it. Or again, the subject steps on the uh, scene of existence and meaning only through the movement of departure and return. However, skepticism itself must be differentiated from the truth it contains. That is, the insight through which we come to recognize this terrifying human condition is not skepticism as such. Rather, Dahl points out, quote, although the skeptical move takes its cue from the sublime moments, it deflects it, unquote. So instead of accepting the human condition, instead of taking on the responsibility this condition places on us, skepticism is in itself inaugurated by an attempt to avoid this human condition and the responsibility it carries it in its name. That is inaugurated by its temptation to view the finitude of the human condition as something negative. The beginning of skepticism, Cavell writes, is the in insinuation of an absence of a line or limitation, hence the creation of want or desire, unquote. A desire that is, for the infinite, 
as contrasted with the now perceived negative finitude. Now I should like to uh, ask the following question. If skepticism creates or establishes desire, or does Cavell want to say a desire, what then is the truth of this desire, just as skepticism has its own truth? Not unlike the skeptics relentless and in the end hopeless desire for the infinite or for the thing itself, in Plato's Gorgias, Paulus and Callicles aspire for complete and unquestionable power epitomized in the figure of the tyrant, an aspiration rooted, as I've, I, I have argued elsewhere, in their irrational attempt to escape human vulnerability. Moreover, and here I come to my central point, Socrates or Plato shows us that in desiring such immunity from vulnerability, one in fact fails to do and to say what one truly wants or desires. That is, the desire for complete invulnerability not only fails to make sense, but perhaps more importantly, it is in fact parasitic upon another desire, a desire not displaced. The same point can be derived from Augustine's conception of sin and error. According to Augustine, every nature has its being through measure, number and order and must be therefore always good. Moreover, and here, and quote, if every good were taken away, what will be left is not something, but rather uh, absolutely nothing. Yet every good is from God. Therefore, there is no nature that is not from God, unquote. So although on its own terms, the skeptic's phantasmatic desire contains privation, it cannot be made sense, that is to say, it cannot be made sense of as it operates with an impossibility, with something non-existent. There is nevertheless something, some truth, some reality or existent in that desire. In other words, what I want to suggest, and perhaps contrary here to Cavell, is that there is something like a positive desire one not created through absence and limitation, but rather the other way around. There is a limitless, infinite perhaps even, desire whose limitlessness and infinity skepticism transmutes into a phantasmatic desire for limitless power. Next, I want to att attempt to transpose what I've called now the truth of desire uh, into, what, into the Cavellian notion of groundlessness noted above. Now the human condition in the key of the truth of desire would then be something like this. <laughs> we are not in a position to say or explain how or why there is meaning, understanding, and how or why there is an I and a you. However, the very possibility for there being something like human language and a self and another hinges on that we are the kinds of beings that desire to turn to each other, that we are the kinds of beings that mean something to each other, even if this results in turning away from the other. It hinges on that we desire not only the other as an object or aim, but desire the other's desire for our desire, for the other's desire ad infinitum. That is, if the other was not always already someone who addressed me, and if this address did not evoke a response from me or a desire in me, and thus transform me or reveal me to myself, and if the other did not in turn respond to my response, that is, if the other was not affected and transformed by my response and thereby returned my address, my desire to me, and if I, once more, was not affected by or transformed by and shown again and again to myself by how my words, how my desire returned to me in and through the other's desire, address qua desire, language would not, not exist. Our understanding of each other and the world that we share through or in language is nothing apart from the very way in which this desire plays out. Uh, <clears throat> in following Espendal's reading, uh, something of the sort seems to be what Cavell is pointing towards with his depiction of meaning as always established to a retrospective movement, a continuous movement between the pawning of the voice and the redeeming of the voice. 
the, the movement in which words, quote, will forever find their way back to me, unquote. However, as Cavell points out, although we are condemned to meaning, that is to say, inescapably moved by each other, nothing guarantees that either I or you acknowledge this. That is to say, acknowledge each other and take responsibility for it. Or as Levinas would put it, the ethical demand of the face of the other is not an ontological necessity. And evil, certain, and e evil is certainly possible, although always banal. So the lack of ontological necessity can, and apparently, or apparently does, make the reality of our desire and the sense of our very lives seem terrifying. And the skeptics attempt to avoid this terrifying condition makes sense only because of how much our existence means to us, because of how our existence is tied to our desire. Or is it so? Can the lack of an uh, phantasmatic and al uh, alternative ontology really do this? That is to say, cause existential terror. How could it? For are we not, after all, obliged to ask, terrifying in contrast to what? Well, the lack of an ontology that would secure our desire cannot at least be terrifying in contrast to a real yet unattainable guarantee or security, a notion as grammatically empty as a round square. For if I could guarantee your desire for me, that is, if I could force or command you to desire me, that is to say my desire, then I would lose the very thing that I desire, namely your desire. As Plato would put it, I would simply be doing what I saw fit rather than what I really wanted. Consequently, the lack of any guarantee or secure ground of the meaningfulness of our lives and ourselves and the world uh, uh, and the world we share with each other seems then to be terrifying only in contrast to itself, that is in contrast to nothing. Or perhaps we might say that being someone who desires the other's desire is terrifying in itself and can, and can thus only contrast itself with nothing. Hence, the displaced desire for skepticism conjoins itself with annihilation, death or emptiness, as this is the only thing that it can contrast the truth of desire with. Put differently, the skeptic's displaced desire for the infinite conceives unconsciously or grammatically of the infinite itself as negative, as naught, rather than as infinite being. In contrast to this displaced desire for the infinite qua naught, I think that the truth of desire describes a positive account of desire and of meaning as a limitless, open-ended, perhaps even infinite becoming and returning. Arguably, or so, I, so I'm proposing, it is exactly this infinite open-endedness which the skeptic's rejection and avoidance must transmute into annihilation, into emptiness. All right, uh, so the conclusion now. I have tried to suggest that it somehow seems misdirected to say that an ontological lack could be the source of our existential terror. Rather, it's only desire itself that can be terrifying. And so far, it seems to me, I'm more or less in tune with Cavell. However, there seems nevertheless to be something perplexing about the very idea that our being is terrifying as such. Is the existential terror we are taking possession of in our face-to-face -face encounters with the truth of our desire issued by a grammatical fact? In what sense is it more true, if it is, that our human condition is tragic or terrifying rather than a miracle of grace or infinitely, uh, or infinitely hopeful? What is it really that makes it so terrifying that this self of mine and the sense of the world emerges only by continuously becoming and returning in relation to the other? And ag again, I do not want to say that uh, it is not or cannot be existentially tragic or terrifying. God knows I know that feeling. Uh, but is our very being not equally and more fundamentally even blessed with love and communion, perhaps even with the infinite love of God? The point I'm driving at here is that 
uh, we are perhaps obliged to say, Pace Cabello, perhaps, that sin originates not simply in the skeptics' deflection of the terrifying human condition, but that the very seeing of the human condition as terrifying is already itself part and parcel of sin. That is, the very seeing of the human condition as terrifying, as tragic, is perhaps not to see the love or communion it continuously gives expression to. My suggestion seems to be this. The truth of desire itself is not, cannot be the reason for, that is to say the cause of the terror, nor of the avoidance of it. Expressed in a Plato platonic or Bistinian idiom, evil is rather than something existent, simply privation of the truth of desire. So um, what I mean to propose is that there are in a radical sense, no reason for uh, reasons for our existential terror or for our avoidance of it. This is to my mind, the radical ethical ex existential truth about us, about our original sin. I want to end then with a final critical reflection meant to invoke discussion. Uh, following Cavell's own observation that our words are always vulnerable, vulnerable to, our, to our own and others' temptations for displacement and repression, I want to ask whether there might be something in the choice of the conceptual horizon provided by Cavell that echoes an attempt to establish reasons for why we avoid our responsibility, why we fail each other. Is there, I am asking, in the identification of a terror and tragedy or groundlessness at the core of our being, a repressed hope invested that this tragedy, that this terror might give uh, us reasons or justifications for our avoidance and thus to receive in the face of the other an affirmation of ourselves as acceptable and even as maybe heroic in some sense. Uh, so, I want to end here. Um, thank you. Uh, sorry, I had a little problem here. Thank you very much, very much for that beautiful uh, presentation, for both of your uh, wonderful presentations. I will now open the forum to all. So raise your hand or write your question in the chat room, uh, chat box if you want. Um, but I will I will take and uh, use my prerogative as, as moderator, and I just want to throw a, a couple of, of questions here uh, to Nicholas and and to to uh, Jonetas. I, I I love uh, Nicholas's your 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 reading, uh, your Kierkegaardian reading, really of ordinary language. Um, uh, I, I I like um, how you how you made clear that Cavell's understanding of skepticism not as a problem, but as an existential condition involves what we might call a religious concern, that it turns philosophy away from the epistemological and moves it rather into the existential. But then you distinguish between two, which in your position and Cavell's, well, you question whether maybe, right? Uh, by claiming that the tragic vision of our condition is somehow contrary to the position you advocate of seeing it rather as a miracle of grace or as an inf infinitely hopeful a situation. But don't you think that the whole point of acknowledgement in Cavell is nothing other than a preparation to take a leap of faith? That behind the tragedy, there is the requirement of an acceptance that is nothing other than that leap of faith. So that's my question to you. And John had us with regard to the differences, you know, between Clark and Cavell, particularly, you say that, uh, that uh, Clark thinks that his analysis of skepticism takes us to insights about human nature and philosophy, and that in that respect moves beyond Austin. But wouldn't you agree that what he understands by those insights shows somehow that he fails to see the existential import that is so patent in Cavell, perhaps a more religious conception of the ordinary that Thompson or Austin never have? All right, so. Um, so do, should we should we respond to to these questions directly? You're muted, so I, don't, I have no idea what you said. But, but um, uh, yes, please do do shortly because we have questions. But but uh, let's let's start there, right? Yeah. 
Well, I can give a very short, I mean, of course, your question is like huge. Uh, and, and obviously my paper is, uh, well, more, more uh, written in, in terms of, of kind of provoking maybe a discussion. But, uh, well, I would, I mean, my response, I mean, it's maybe true. I mean, so the, the question I'm asking, I mean, there, that there is, uh, you might be right. I mean, of course, there's a certain sense in which, which I think cavells the whole uh, idea of acknowledgement is in a certain sense, a way of, of, a, of ex existentially transforming our attitude towards as it were the condition, the human condition, and, and in that sense, seeing seeing it as some maybe, well, here's the question of what's involved here. What, what kind of a, how does it transform our relationship to uh, the ordinary? Uh, uh, and here I'm less certain what, I mean, it seems to me still that uh, Cavell somehow wants to, I mean, I get this feeling somehow that Cavell still wants to see that there's something definitely really there that that our existence is in a certain in a very absolute sense uh, finite uh, and also somehow terrifying and tragic and and that's why but still there's a transformation i mean so i'm not sure how to place this but the, but i think there's still another dimension which is which doesn't have to do with with how we place how we understand the fundamentals of, of our existence but rather about the the very way in which we have to be all the time uh, as it were alert to to how we can how the way in which we depict uh, and and give very I mean very good depictions also maybe of, of, of reality and the human condition how that those very depictions in themselves are always always vulnerable to our own uh, ways in which we want to, as it were, hide from from our own selves. So, so I'm just saying that that the depiction in itself of, uh, be it how good as it were or, or how elaborate, might in itself already uh, uh, invite or be a, an expression of our very ways in which we want try to avoid things. So this is uh, so this is just in, in that sense a kind of a uh, a further question that. Can, can there be something in, in which uh, our ways of seeing the world as terrible, might there be something already there invested in, in that very seeing that might be problematic? So this is just kind of an open opening to the question. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Jornadas. Well, yes. Um, I'll try a short answer too, but perhaps I'll need some help from you to, to see if I understood the question. But I think... I am in agreement that both Austin and Clark, but especially Austin, do not pay attention, at least in the works I know of them, to this existential ground of skepticism. And that's very important in Cavell. I didn't really went into that in this particular paper, but I do in some other works. Uh, but there is a the problem about Clark, and perhaps other people can help me here, uh, is that the only things he published were, were the, that paper that I used, The Legacy of Skepticism, another on seeing surfaces. And there is a PhD dissertation somewhere that I, I, I haven't read. And this paper basically ends uh, opening a a field of investigation, a kind of research program, so to speak. And I think of how it's in part responding to that research program. So I think at least it is in Clark. Clark is open to the possibility that there is more to these. And he says at some point, I quote in the paper, a, a short uh, qualification that he makes about skepticism having to do this view of the ordinary as restricted as having to do with some intellectual something like he almost says it's, it's all too human uh, it is a we will naturally ask that kind of question and this is something that austin doesn't care too much you know austin is more or less saying those questions are silly and i think uh Clark is at least open to the possibility that there is more to them, that they are asked from a point of view of, of you know, 
acknowledge infinitude, but he doesn't say much about that. So I, I don't know what he could say more about, but uh, and in any case, I think Cavell does. And that's a very important, uh, you know, additional step, step that he takes in relation to both Austin and Clark. So that's more or less the way I understand those. Yeah, yeah, no, 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 that's, you're clarifying exactly what I was asking. Uh, yeah, uh, so we have three uh, uh, persons that are in line. Sala, uh, uh, you are the first, then Gordon, who uh, he raised his hand in the chat room, and then Stephen. Please, Sala. Thank you very much both for your papers. I really enjoyed them. Um, I have uh, a few comments on uh, Nicholas's paper or perhaps a question. I really appreciated your depiction of the opening paragraph of uh, the philosophical investigations as this kind of Ursay uh, in particular describing everything that's at stake in uh, learning language and meaning understanding and what is already there between the parent and the child uh, in order for, uh, for them to communicate. And and of course, in relation to that, uh, you mentioned that this is a kind of a picture or perhaps a mytho mytho mythology. Um, and to me, it seems like there is a difference between, you know, describing it as a, as a certain kind of picture because couldn't one say that that is precisely uh, one of the things Wittgenstein criticizes are pictures that told us captive in a way. And uh, to me, the way that you describe, um, you know, everything that comes into, to, language learning or speaking or understanding and in particular through the concept of desire it's precisely not I, I mean in a sense it's not a picture that that is what language is or that is what understanding is uh, and on the other hand then again um well, I call it a mytholo mytho mythology since in a sense what you want to say is like we need to change precisely our picture of you know language understanding and so on um and then another thing that came to mind was the way in which you talk about desire as this kind of uh, relational kind of, um, what should I say, bouncing between the self and the other in a way that, you know, I, on the one hand, I desire the other, but on the other hand, I desire the desire of the other. And to me, uh, there is pretty much at stake also in kind of making that distinction, because it's one thing to kind of in open endedness desire the other or or have a, a kind of open, loving, maybe to speak with Murdoch or Bale kind of attitude to the other. And then again, to desire that desire in a sense. I mean, I think that there are different ways in which that could be read or understood. And of course, if, if uh, be, yeah, um, thinking about it as some kind of uh, external relation that somehow is there between us, which to me then easily also becomes a kind of metaphysical picture. So uh, those were just two short comments that I, uh, but thank you. Thank you. All right, yeah, yeah, thanks, Allah. Uh, well, to the first uh, question about the mythology and picture, uh, I think I, I, my point is, well, I mean, I agree with you, but, but my point is that there is, uh, I'm thinking here specifically in, as, um, let us call in, let us call it the structure or the, as it were, the place of that Ursen in the philosophical investigation as a mythology, in the sense that uh, that it's a, it's not that that picture, as it were, uh, that nothing can happen, or that it it somehow uh, that it depicts uh, a reality of language uh, game, in the sense, and because of course there's a lot of problems. So I mean, the investigations always, I mean, the object uh, language that's depicted there, and all, all these kinds of things. But as a, but in its, as it were, its position as a point of origin of, of language of uh, uh, it, and and I would say that uh, rather than as it were in a certain sense, well, this is always the idea of origin is always in a certain sense I think retrospective in the sense it comes that it's the discussions as it were, in this temptation to find some kind of a absolute explanation or kind of a even causal relation from from something simple to, to language, for instance, uh, that that or to meaning uh, and that failure as it were, that uh, and, and in that sense, it's a, the scene, it, it opens with a certain scene, which in that sense, you can call a mythology. It's not that that's really how it was 
you know uh, how really our language really was but it's a it's a certain kind of mythology that in to which we can always kind of as it were relate or somehow which always reflects something about ourselves and we in which we find ourselves as it were but it's not a depiction of reality of things how things really are so this is so that's uh, i mean one way of, i gather somehow in, in which i want to understand the idea of mythology here uh and when it comes to the other question i mean yeah i agree i mean this is of course let us say it's um my depiction of desire as as this kind of uh continuous uh as it were that it's that desire my point is here i gather that the desire lacks in a certain sense an object uh, uh, an object as it were in the sense also of something that there would be something which would as it were satisfy my desire in this uh, in this sense that that it would somehow because satisfaction would somehow always kill the desire so in that sense there's a uh, i try to kind of understand desire here as a certain kind of continuous movement which doesn't find its object uh, or uh, and satisfaction but which somehow always relates with you know i say something to you uh, in that sense i desire i mean i put something forth to you and in that putting forward to you i'm somehow waiting for you to respond i want to see i want your desire as it were to respond to me and that will always transform me and but i will be as you address me back i will I will do. I mean, I will uh, again so, see, become somehow, find myself through your desire, through your address, and then I will, and that will continue. So, in that sense, there's not an object of satisfaction. There is not no point, as it were, an object where where you could, could put, as it were, a stop to this, or where you would find an object of, that would satisfy this process. So, but of course, there's a lot of. I mean, your question raises a lot of things which. Uh, as I would kind of put again, I mean, all, all these descriptions are obviously open and vulnerable to all kinds of misunderstandings and, and, and kind of false projections and things like that. So that's, of course, true. Yeah, yeah if I can just shortly say it, it was, thank you for clarifying, because I think uh, the understanding of desire that comes from psychoanalysis has such a kind of there is such a strong association with different kinds of objects precisely uh so so yeah thank you for for clarifying gordon hi i want to thank uh nicholas and yonardas for such nice papers and yonardas in particular i was i was thrilled by your paper and um i have like a tiny question and a foggy question. And the 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 tiny question is I'll start the foggy one. The foggy one is I I haven't just come off reading uh Clark and Cavell. And so you're getting me, you're making me uh imagine what it's like to read them. It, um uh and so you get something of a memory. I, oh I, I what I I wanted to I was just wondering what if you had something to say about the, the style, manner, mode in which Clark does his philosophy and the style, manner, mode in which Cavell does his philosophy. As you were describing uh, Clark's papers, I, re I remember reading them and um, I, I don't think I felt it at the time, but in your, dis in your, in, 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 in your paper, rem remembering them, I, they, I wondered whether he had some, whether he was unable, it was more that he sounds a little bit like a magician. Uh, all these these stories, those plane spotters, and so forth, and then at the end, the conceptual human, uh, the standard conception, the standard conceptual human constitution uh, evaporates, and I just feel like I don't know. I feel like I I believe. Cavell's the end of Cavell's sentence he's gets me to a place kind of like belief and um at the end of Clark's sentences I end up kind of like I don't know in awe as before a very sharp knife um and so that's that's the that's the foggy question and the tiny question is um whether or not you feel a tension between those that bit in the claim of reason where Cavell says, uh, 
I'm not saying the words have lost their meaning. They mean what a good dictionary says they mean. And then in the discussion of the green jar, it turns out that maybe in those situations, they have lost their meaning since they mean nothing. Th those are the two questions. Well, <clears throat> thank you, Gordon. The, the tiny question is not <laughs> tiny, or at least the, the answer is not tiny. But um, I would try to defend Cavell in saying that perhaps he could say, I, I agree that the, apparently there is a tension there. But I think the point would be, I would put this way, you know, the words do, we can talk about meanings of words, but that's just an abstraction. That's what we have in our dictionary. We abstract from many different uses. We leave some, uh, you know, untouched. We leave some projections that we haven't made yet open. And the dictionary is basically, you know, amass some, some of the important ones. And, and that's an abstraction. So there is a sense in which, okay, words have the meanings they, the dictionary says they have. But that's just talking about a kind of dimension of meaning that depends upon the primary phenomenon of language games, practices, forms of life, uses, and so forth. Uh, so I, I, I see the apparent tension, but I don't think, I think we could kind of save Cavell from the apparent contradiction by saying, you know, that there is a sense in which, uh, actually in the case of the green jar that I quote, words lose their meaning in the strong, important sense. They do not lose their meaning in the dictionary sense. They, we can still define them. You know, knowing is what the dictionary says it is. But in this particular context, a person use, is using this tool, this word. I don't see why. I don't see the point. I don't see what it's doing. It's a kind of, what is the image? Uh, I forgot in English, but uh, something running <laughs> loosely without connecting to the oh, mechanism. The wheel, the wheel. The, yeah, so I, I don't know if that's enough, but I, I see the apparent tension. I think I was struck by it at some point too. About the foggy question, that's hard. But, but the hardest thing has again to do with Clark because Clark's paper is so dense that you know yeah. a, a sentence in that paper kind of transforms into pages in the claim of reason. So <laughs> that's kind of a part of the, the difficulty. Perhaps that explains the idea of something of a magician in Clark. It's, I, I read that paper, I don't know how many dozens of times, and I'm still not 100% sure that I got everything he is saying there. So, uh, and there is a, an important difference in style also has to do with, um, uh, I think, Clark's paper is more theoretical in a sense. It's more, you know, I use that analogy of wholesale versus that. That is a um, distinction that Cora Diamond uh, made to understand the difference between the Tractatus and later Wittgenstein. The Wittgenstein, the Tractatus, was trying to, you know, uh, resolve philosophical problems in a wholesale fashion with a. Uh, for example, a theory of the conditions of meaning. And then he starts going through language games. And this is an important difference. I, I think Clark is closer to the early Wittgenstein. He's thinking about concepts, the way concepts work in a very abstract way and seeing there is something wrong with the skeptical, with the philosophers actually, uh, conception of our standard human constitution. And we, we must put something better in place, but I have no idea what would be Clark's response, or what would be Clark, Clark's proposal, but I have the impression it would be more theoretical than Cavell's. It would be less, it would have less to do with this sense of what to say when. It would be have more to do with perhaps presenting a better theory of how concepts work, which is not exactly how Cavell thinks about Wittgenstein criteria and so forth. So I, I'm not sure whether this, you know, is an answer because, uh, but there is a very important difference in style, and I think it has to do with a difference in the way they conceive the task of philosophy. But it's hard to say anything very concrete about Clark. I'm more, I am more confident about Cavell than about Clark. 
Thank you, Yonagas. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, we have uh, uh, Stephen, then we have Fernando Carlucci in the uh, chat room, and and then Byron. Stephen, please. Uh, thank you, thank you, Victor, and thank you, Yonadas and Nicholas. I I love both of those papers. I'm. Uh, I'll communicate with each of you privately. I already did briefly with Nicholas to say that I've got thoughts that are still trying to formulate. Can I, I, I wanna pick up off of, I, I have a different question, but I wanna say something about Gordon's vague thought, which I think I think Gordon, it's, it's so important. There, there is no other philosophical text that sounds anything like Thompson Clark. And it's neither plain nor philosophical, it's Martian or something. And it's obviously not accidental, right? Nobody just finds themselves sitting down and writing that way. Um, I mean, there's something about Clark. You know, I, since I was a student at Berkeley when he was still teaching, I was able to go to his classes and, and watch his performances. So, you know, watching him draw a circle and then draw a hemisphere and show you, you know, now have I defined a backside to this object? Um, so there's, there's something definitely to be thought about in, in that, that I think um, so I'm really grateful to you for raising it. It's not Austin. It's not anybody. I mean, so uh, I wanted, but then I wanted to say something about the tiny question. And Yonadas, I, I don't understand why, why you don't just say this. Um, the issue with the green jar, it's not that the words are meaningless. The, the, the issue is that the person is meaningless, right? The, the, the person is not in a position to mean any of the things that the, the word could mean. Um, so I don't see, I, I'm confused about why you're, why you're struggling over, um, wait, the words mean what they always mean, what a good dictionary says they are, but here the words are meaningless. The words are not meaningless. This is, I mean, this is what you're, I took it you were pointing out about the skeptic's position they the skeptic faces i mean the the traditional epistemologist faces this this situation where um they're perfectly there's nothing there's absolutely nothing wrong with saying i know this is a hand under ideal observational circumstances there are plenty of things you could mean by that but none of the things that you could mean by that are going to say what you want to say are going to have the consequences you want that to have, um, so so that just is a puzzle for me. Um, Can I just say why it seemed a puzzle? Why? Because I, I mean, it was my little question. The, um, uh, it seemed puzzling to me because it seemed like leaving the meanings of the words safe and just putting the problem in whether Fred could mean something by the words opened up the possibility for some Gricean negotiation of this. Yeah, that was the concern. Oh, now I understand your concern. Yeah, I think we should avoid that <laughs> consequence. Yeah. Uh, and I think, let me, first, I, I agree with everything that um, Stephen said. So per perhaps I should you know, try to make myself cl clearer. But I think in Clark, there is this, uh, apparently he is working with, uh, and perhaps Stephen can correct me. I, it is with a lot of trepidation that I say something about Clark in front of this public here, because I know you people know him much better than I do. But I have the impression from reading his work that he is working with something like that Gricean distinction between, I don't know, semantics and pragmatics. And, and there is, you know, what the words mean in, the, in themselves. And then mm -hmm. another layer that has to do with our practices. And that's part of what I think it's kind of theoretical in his work that Cavell is uh, trying to avoid. And so for Cavell, it is important that, so perhaps this is why I apparently went 
uh, against what Stephen said, it is important to say that there is a sense in which those words uttered in that context, that it's not that they, you know, in a sense, they still have meaning, but it's just in that secondary abstract sense. But in a fuller sense, there is no meaning being produced in that context, I would say, you know, it, of course, it is the person uttering them that is meaningless in a sense. But, you know, there is no meaning. Meaning is lost at that point. There is only this abstraction that we can call meaning and it is in the dictionary. So I'm trying to make clearer that, uh, but precisely in order to avoid something like a Gricean reading of the, the distinction between those uh, yeah. That there are no layers of meaning. Their meaning fully, you know, fleshed out is meaning in a specific context when a specific person utters and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. All the rest is abstraction. Yeah. So this is I hope it clarifies. And about just about Clark uh well, I, I agree with Stephen again that he is not it's different from anything else I ever read. So, you know, it's a specific style that we have to understand better. But thank you, Stephen, for your question. Um, yeah, so, so Victor, I just want to make clear that wasn't my question. So, so, so now I want, to ask, I want to ask my question. And I don't really know if I have a question yet. Um, but, but I have, I'm going to use uh, Gordon's taxonomy, uh, which seems to me exhaustive of the tiny and the vague. Um, so um, so I, th I think I have a vague question for Yonidas, and then I have um, uh, uh, a note of appreciation or something for Nicholas that's also going to get to maybe a question for Yonidas. Uh, the vague question for Yonidas is, um, I guess I'm wondering whether you're recapitulating what Cavell saw as the outrage of, of Stroud discussing his views of skepticism without taking into account part four of the claim of reason. Um, so, so that's just the vague question. Um, cause, you know, the reason, the reason he didn't publish the claim of reason for, I don't know, something like almost 20 years after he wrote it was that, as he says in the introduction, as you well know, he felt like he had arrived at nowhere. And it wasn't until after part four that he felt like he actually had something to say about skepticism that he was willing to make uh, public. So, so that's just a vague question. Um, Nicholas, I wanted to say, I really, really like um, your emphasis on desire and on, um, and on, on conversation as, um, I don't, um, that, I mean, I think Cavell is, I guess I'm agreeing maybe with Victor that that I don't see Cavell as so in, impressed by something like terror or groundlessness. I don't think Cavell thinks groundlessness. I don't I don't think that's what he sees as the truth of skepticism. That is skepticism is the the view that somehow something is groundless. Um, and so I don't, I don't think that's what he thinks as is the truth of skepticism, but I think that what you're, what you're drawing attention to is the way in which conversation is always sort of eliciting responsiveness, and and that that it's the 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 mutual shaping of the space between participants and of the participants that's that's potentially that's that you hope will be ongoing right that it, that it doesn't come to some kind of natural end um so i'm seeing that as connected with the material in part three of the claim of reason about uh, recognizing the position of the other um 
But it seems to me, I guess what I'm liking about it, and this is where it comes around to a question about Yonadas or, or for Yonadas, maybe again, is that um, it seems like Cavell's Wittgensteinian idea of ordinary language isn't a vision of trying to find agreement because agreement is where conversation stops, at least if it's agreement about matters of fact, right? It's agreement in judgment makes possible ongoing conversation. But coming to find, oh, we agree, then there's nothing more to say. So I think I see Cavell as very much in sympathy with your, with your reading of this sort of ongoing um, offer of responsiveness and call for responsiveness that that the idea of acknowledgement that Victor brought up seems to me uh, to have at its heart. I, I know that wasn't a question. It was just a kind of, um, I, I, I guess it's a way of saying I really liked what you were doing, but I wasn't sure whether you were criticizing Cavell or or not. Well, let me try to answer quickly, at, at least the last part. I was not. I think I agree with everything you said. I never thought in these terms that agreement is the end of the conversation. I never, that was clear to me, but I agree that Cavell's vision of the basis, the groundless ground for our uh, language, for meaning, uh, depends on that constant, I, I say something about a constant negotiation and we, I have to try to show to my interlocutor some aspects that I value and, you know, it's similar to art criticism in a sense, as it says, for ordinary language philosophy, it's similar to, to make a, an aesthetic judgment. I have to call attention to some aspects that I am interested in and try to show to other person and then that's risky I can expose myself and see that we do not agree so yeah I think we are in agreement about it. But that. is the idea there that you want to get the other person to go oh yeah I agree with you um, I suppose yeah that's the... oh see that's no that's what I that's what I'm that's what I'm saying it seems to me Nicholas's paper takes us beyond that because oh, okay because that's just the end of conversation and then we're done with each other um, and if that's the point of if that's the point of conversation, then the point of conversation seems to me to end conversation. Um, but I hope that's not the point of conversation. And that's what it seems. I, that's what I was saying. I think Nicholas is trying to show us. Oh no, no, this is this is the the thing to be celebrated about human language. Is that okay? It, there's this infinite possibility of continuation if I if if we if we care to um, if all we care about is selling wood to one another then as soon as we come to an agreement we go good we've agreed now now take your wood yeah but I, I take it that the agreement is always provisional and there's also I agree that there's always an infinite possibility of finding that we there is a smaller point that we were not making clear, and now we see that we disagree and we can't continue, but you know. But let me ponder about that. About your first question. But, but wait, isn't isn't just Yonadas, wait, wait a minute. Isn't okay. isn't isn't my interest in talking with you you not about getting rid of these oh no wait it turned out there's still this little disagreement we can so we can keep talking because we um i'm interested in you um that's what i would think that's what i would think conversation is is about not oh uh no thank god we've still got some little disagreement that we can keep talking about yeah i have to think more about that but i think we are we you would agree that if there is you know like deep disagreement, there is no conversation. There must be some shared agreement in judgment. judgment. Agreement, yeah, agreement judgment in judgment that lets us talk. Yeah, mm -hmm. that lets us talk. But then what fascinates us, what keeps us talking is our inexhaustibility and that 
I mean, again, I'm I'm going on too long, but that that I <laughs> that that you're not you're not done. You know, I haven't gotten to the bottom of anyone. I, I, I love I love the way you put it. That, that we're, our interest is not in what you're saying, but in you. I mean, in what you're saying, insofar as it is you, and you are inexhaustible. Um, we have to move on. And what, can I hear from Nicholas? Oh yeah, sure. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I can come. I mean, concerning Cavell, at least uh, to what extent. Uh, uh, I gather, I mean, I was always also, I mean, I think I find what I was saying quite close to, I mean, I, I kind of referred to this, the, the pawning of the voice and the redeeming, of course. I mean, this is central. I mean, it, it somehow captures very much what, what I, how I also think about the, the question. Uh, and, and I gather that, I mean, it's, uh, if, if nothing else, then it's, it, I mean, my attempt was just to, uh, to, as it were, somehow continue the discussion, as it were. I mean, to see, to to see where I mean, to exp also to bring forth that there is. I mean, that we all constantly are, uh, as it were, faced with this question. So what? When I see, when I describe the world this way, when when I also when I describe when we describe, well, I'm interested in you. I mean, that's that's not that always comes the question, so what does it mean for me to really be interested in you? And, and all things, they, they, I mean, philosophy doesn't stop there and, and we have to continue as it were, trying to understand, so what is it really about you? I mean, so, so this is, that was, I mean, to frame it easily, that would be just, uh, and, and trying to get a glimpse of what, because Cavell, I think partly, I mean, he still seems this has to, in, in different ways, uh, still seems to see, for instance, desire. I mean, he, he at some point at least he, he thinks of desire or want as somehow created by this limit. Uh, and that's why I would say, well, maybe not, I mean, that there, there's maybe not this kind of, I'm not saying that he's always saying, but there's this tendency. So so uh, in a, to put it short, I mean, I, I gather that what I'm searching for is also I mean, always in philosophy, there has to be somehow to get a grasp of the spirit in which somebody is talking, and not only about how good the things that are said are. Are so. I mean, that would be one one quick response. Uh, and and of course, this is yeah. Yeah. Thank you. To be to be continued. I'm sure. It's it's enormous, and we'll have chance, I think, to continue. Um, a, a colleague of mine, I just was reading him, and and there's something that he says that uh, is called by what you're saying, and that is that philosophy is not about understanding; it is about what we don't understand. And of course, there's always something we don't understand about the other, because precisely there's that opaqueness that underlies uh, the ability to speech let us say. But anyway, let's move on. Fernando Carlucci. And uh, we have uh, Fernando Carlucci, then Byron, then Nancy, and then Sandra, in that order. Well, thanks, Victor. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, so, Nicholas, thanks for your talk. Um, it was very inspiring for me, especially because um, at the beginning of my search in Cavell, I was interested in the connections between his works in psychoanalysis. So my question is about this possible approximations. And um, it's perhaps it's not, uh, it doesn't go straight to the point of your uh, um, paper, but it's something that uh, I, cannot, um, I cannot avoid uh, asking because uh, due to my interests. So as I understand, I, I'm just gonna read what I, what I wrote. So as I understand uh, Lacan's idea, of recognition of my desire through the other's desire. The terrifying challenge of knowing myself is that following my own desire brings disorder to the world. Um, I, take it, I take this idea, especially from Freud's um, civilization and its discontent, uh, where the, my desire is the expression of the concessions I have to do in order to foster civilization. So the idea is that Desire brings some, my 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 desire brings something very intimate about who I am. Uh, so in that sense, 
um, my desire is contrary to the value of ordinary life to give it some, you know, um, uh, it, it, I, th I see a, a contrast between ordinary or, and bringing, uh, um, valuing ordinary life and ordinary um, words uh, and desire in the sense that Lacan's understand it. So um, I, my question is, uh, well, if what terrifies me in my desire is, not, is the detachment from the world it entails, a very similar position the skeptic takes in relation to the world, to the world. If this understanding is correct, would you agree that Lacan is side by side uh, with the skeptic? So the idea is that um, I, I, I remember reading something very close to this in uh, Toriel Moy's uh, Revolutions of the Ordinary, uh, where she puts Lacan on the side of the skeptic and bringing some, you know, some detachment from the world. And I'm not sure whether uh, the the way you reconstruct the skeptic's position has to do with this, with the idea that um, also acknowledging my own desire and uh, the disorder it brings to the world would put me side by side with the skeptic. So this is my, what I've been following. And uh, I would like to hear you about this. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I mean, this is a very, uh... A, a very hard, uh, I mean, a very complicated question, I think, uh, especially given Lacan's uh, own very intricate theories of the desire. I mean, uh, at least I would say this, that yes, I think there's something to it uh, in which, in the sense in which Lacan is closer to the skeptic, because for Lacan, um, there is, I mean, he's, the way in which, for instance, he, he divides desire or, or places desire as this, as this surplus uh, in the, uh, as it were, in the incommensurability between need and uh, and, uh, and and demand, for instance. So, and and how desire is placed exactly at the point in which uh, the satisfaction of a need never uh, coincides with with uh, with the demand. And the reason for this is, especially in the early Lacan, the reason for this is. That that there is no guarantee of the recognition for the other. So this this, uh, this uh, demand for the other's love uh, is never included. I mean that there's a certain kind of phantasmatic idea, as it were, already invested in subjectivity as such. Uh, exactly because there's this distinction between that there's always this form of alienation or or separation uh, in the uh, in subjectivity as it, as in itself. So, so in that sense, there's, as it were, as desire is the result, uh, especially for early Lacan, in this uh, inability uh, to, to, to affirm, as it were, uh, absolutely the other's recognition of, of oneself. Uh, and in this sense, that it's a skeptical, I mean, because the conditions for that very recognition is already non-existent. So, so already the the demand for this kind of recognition, uh, for those condition, those conditions being, as it were, phantasmatic in themselves. So, in that sense, you could see it as you know close to the uh, to the skeptical. Uh, when it comes to the later Lacan, I, I think that it gets more complicated because uh, there the whole point is that desire uh, is is partly, uh, as it were, a result of the what what he would call this uh, the as it were the not all of the symbolic in itself, which has I mean it's called more or less the same structural idea there that that the symbolic always as it were uh, in terms of what we can make sense of what what can have meaning always has as it were uh, a pure what he calls a pure negativity or for instance Zizek would call pure negativity as it were around itself. Uh, so there's, and, and, but that already is the very conditions for language as it, as it in itself. So desire in this sense is already a condition. Now how to describe that, uh, I would say also, I mean, the sense in which I think I read and, or perhaps utilize Wittgenstein here uh, is in the sense that also that, because there's the, the, idea, the idea is always to, to describe desire as something 
form through 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 law, through a limitation, through something something which is restricted. That is to say, for the, the restriction here being uh, the the uh, as it were prohibition of of the fulfillment of, of our fantasy, which would, in a certain sense, which is annihilation, which is death, right? So, I mean, there's a lot of similarities in the way in which, for instance, Cavell places the skeptical, uh, fantas the fantasy of the skeptical is, in a sense, emptiness, I mean, or, or death, so there's a co close relation here. Uh, whereas I would, in a certain sense, see that you can describe, or in a certain sense, must <laughs> describe desire in its in its positive sense, rather, as a, as a kind of that that desire itself is not, as it were, cannot in a, in that sense be an object of our knowledge or analysis. But desire is all. I mean, because the analysis in itself is already done in language, in meaning, so to speak, already. Uh, and and in that sense, desire is all pervasive in in becomes all pervasive in this theory. Uh, so well, that's a short and complicated answer but but of course i mean to, to say i mean I, there's a lot there i mean i think there's something to pursue there in in that uh, relation at least thanks a lot Merci. so so should i go now or okay uh, i'll try to be quick i know we're kind of running out of time uh I really enjoyed both of your papers. They were a real joy to read. I guess officially my question is is for Jonadas, but I imagine that Niklas has things to say about this also. So it's it's for both of you. But um, and it was also in many ways my question was anticipated by Stephen and especially Stephen's reference to part four of the claim of reason. So part of my question is sort of what significance does that have here? Uh, but but especially um, I wanted to note. Uh, and ask about uh, the importance of what would seem like a very obvious affinity between Cavell and Austin, and a very obvious difference between the two of them and Clark, which is, of course, the importance that skepticism about other minds plays for Cavell and Austin, uh, but does not play for Clark. And of course, one issue here might be just that we, since we have so little of, of Clark, he certainly had opinions about skepticism about other minds, I imagine. But it's just not not a not not a part of what we officially have of him. Um, on the other hand, it's central for for Cavell and Austin. But then there are also other questions about whether whether it really was central for Austin, whether um, whether questions about skepticism of other minds was really something he substantially engaged with in in the other minds paper, as opposed to just being uh, the occasion for his talking about skepticism more generally, uh, responding to John Wisdom's paper on on other minds, or whether uh, it's in Austin's work more generally that we have something closer to an engagement with questions about otherness and recognition, like in uh, how to do things with words and and questions about performative utterances and that kind of thing, illocution. Um, so uh, so I guess my question is like, let's not uh, let uh, Stephen's point about um, part four of the claim of, of, of uh, part four of the claim of reasons to bias. And I wanted to ask Jonas, what to what extent is uh, can we understand the aspects, the distinctive aspects of Cavell's account of skepticism that he's bringing out, um, like having to do with I mean, against Austin, uh, the um, the possibility of uh, of uh, of the skeptic the skeptics claim being understandable versus against Clark, uh, his having a what I think Jonas puts very positively, very appropriately, like a, a, um, a piecemeal as opposed to a um, wholesale account, account of skepticism, how much of that has to do with his pre preparing for his account of uh, skepticism about others, skepticism about other minds, tragedy, and that kind of thing, and how much of that is, is informed by uh, questions of, of attunements, mutual attunement, and that kind of thing, where um, uh, we can understand that there are uh, good, um, again, to return kind of to, to Stephen's question, there are good forms of agreement and bad forms of agreement. Good forms of agreement can be put in terms of, of attunement, as, as Jonah just puts it in, in his paper. Bad forms, of, bad forms of agreement would be forms of, of skepticism, forms of uh, um, cases of eviscerating separateness from the other, as opposed to um, moments of declaring one's uh, separateness from the other that could be a part understood as a part of good forms of agreement, good forms of, of attunement. Um, 
so anyway, just 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 to summarize my question, it's it's that uh, how how significant uh, for the distinctive features of Cavell's account of skepticism that Jonadis is bringing out, how much of that is coming out of this this affinity with with Austin and this difference between the two of them um, and and Clark, and how much of this uh, and how and what are the distinctive differences between uh, Cavell and Austin on the specific question of having to do with skepticism about other minds. Thank you. Wow, that's, <laughs> I'll have to think about this for years, I think, but, but thank you. That is a great question. Uh, at, about Austin, I can't really say much about his whole opus because I'm not a specialist in Austin, but at least if we restrict our attention to the other minds paper, I, my impression is something that you said that Austin basically uses, uh, he's really interested about skepticism in general. I don't see nothing in that paper that shows there is something specific about the other mind's case that's different. Actually, the way he starts the paper is, well, we have wisdom questions, wisdom's questions about other minds, but I will start with the simpler case that is, you know, our knowledge of an object. I can't remember if it's the, the, the bird or what is the first example, but it's some object, it's not other minds. And he's saying, you know, let's do this and then I'll go back to that. So he seems to be implying that there is, a, you know, the, the same kind of grammatical reminders could be made about other minds and it, it would be basically the same response. That's, that's my impression about Austin. About Cavell, I, and going back to what uh, Stephen asked about part four, I, I would agree with you now, uh, Byron, that I, I didn't think in those terms, but you said something about good forms of agreement and bad forms of agreement. And it, 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 what you call bad forms of agreement have to do with, uh, I think, let me go back to the good ones. The good ones are, as I said, always provisional. They accept the separateness of the other. Um, there is always room for us to go deeper and discover that there was more to that conversation that we could bring up. So that there is no final ground where the spade is turned, in a sense, I think. And I think the case of the that's the reason why it is important for Cavell, uh, perhaps, I don't know if autobiographically or what, but uh, that he discovered that clearly, more clearly when dealing with the other minds case. And as, as you know, already in the first, the, the, the first two parts, the, the part two basically of the claim of reason, where he is officially just talking about skepticism about other minds, the uh, uh, sorry about the external world the other minds problem comes to the scene at, at an important juncture and he says i will say more about this later so i think for cavell there is a sense in which understanding the stakes involved in uh, our relation to the other is fundamental in order to understand the, the problem of the external world what are the stakes involved how can we solve it and what what is the truth in skepticism. So uh, I would say that uh, going back to Stephen's question about Stroud, I have a paper actually trying to defend Cavell from Stroud's criticism that I gave once in Brazil when Stroud was here. <laughs> and I basically tried to do something like that, show that we, there are other aspects of Cavell's work that we can, I think Stroud is right in pointing that there are some things that sound to, I don't know, to close to the traditional skeptical way of putting the problem of the external world. But if we go to the end of the claim of reason and think back, we can learn something. So I don't know, the, the short answer is, I think it's very important for Cavell uh, that there is uh, something to be learned in the case of the other that we can then think about the similarities and differences with the case of external world. And I don't see that in Austin at all. So. I don't know if this, there is much more to your question, but this is just some first impressions about you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, then our, our, our next uh, 
A uh, question comes from Nancy Youssef. Okay, hello. Uh, can everybody hear me? Um, so yeah, thank you very much for both those papers. Uh, and my question uh, is is not unrelated to Stephen's question about um, about the place of disagreement uh, in your in your accounts. So uh, I think a, a term that came up in both papers, vulnerability, disappointment, and you know, so really this is a question for either or, or both of you. Uh, about where we locate misunderstanding or where you would locate misunderstanding um, on ordinary occasions. Uh, so um, Jonah Das, I think, had a very nice formulation uh, about the ordinary as a moving target, um, a dynamic background for attunement. Uh, and if I understood um, Stephen's question to you uh, correctly, uh, part, I mean, attunement is a background or is a background or a context within which um, disagreement arises, right? Or within which misunderstanding can occur. And so Cavell, you know, and certainly Wittgenstein behind, behind him are inviting us to recognize or respond to misunderstanding by continuing to speak, right? Um, uh, recognizing that um, recognizing that we might find ourselves at any moment um, in a, in a place of uh, not being understood or not understanding um, the other. And there's nothing more ordinary than that and perhaps nothing more difficult than that. Um, but what it's not, uh, and, and to borrow some terms from Nicholas's uh, paper, what it's not necessarily, is uh, terrifying or tragic or, um, you know, reason to, to that, that skepticism, in other words, is a deflection um, from just th these ordinary moments of, uh, of, of misunderstanding. So um, I'm just kind of wondering about the, the, the I'm wondering about the place of, uh, of that, like what is, where is the place of sort of friction, disagreement, um, small d disappointments? Um, that are so important, uh, you know, in in Cavell's when he's when Cavell's not writing about Shakespeare, right, or when we're not in a high pitch of melodramatic mutual alienation. Well, perhaps Nicholas has something more. I, I, um, yeah. Something well, different. I guess. Yeah. Well, like I said, I mean, this, this is a huge question. I mean, I, I gather that I would, uh, I would be inclined to s somehow. Uh, begin responding to that question by by saying, I mean, uh, well, pointing out first, I mean, that, that there's always this question, I mean, when we think about, we call them ordinary, ordinary instances of misunderstanding, for instance. Now, there seems to be always a question about what's involved in my not understanding you, for instance. I mean, because it doesn't seem, I mean, I don't think that there is any, uh, any, as it were, generic sense of misunderstanding another person, because it it might always be a question about, for instance, that you, that you don't understand what you're saying, and how could I understand? Or then I misunderstand you because my attitude towards you is callous. I mean, I don't I don't want to understand you. I want to show you. I want to show you in a bad light, for instance, or I want to, uh, you know, somehow. Uh, place a wedge be between us so that you know I don't have to you know communicate with you or I can leave you or whatever so this I mean I get a, there's a huge number of different ways in which we don't understand and of course then there can be misunderstandings in a very good spirit also that I mean I gather that uh, that they, I mean I get that the, the most the best the most few, fruitful as it were instances where where both of us are somehow, not really clear of what's going on. And there are, I mean, of course, because there are, there is a world in a certain sense. I mean, how that world is somehow, I would gather in a constitutive sense, informed by, by what I call here desire. Uh, there is a world in which there's all, a lot of things which we don't understand in the sense of, for instance, knowing how things are. So. Yeah, so, so precisely, yeah. if, I, if I can just follow up, I think the way that yeah. you just spun out um, that that range of possible misunderstandings, each one of them was like a small, you know, potential, very precise vignette, 
right? Yeah. Um, of, of conversation rather than like an overarching theory of misunderstanding. Right? Yeah. And that seems to, so this, you know, leads on to a kind of methodological question, right? That, um, that, that a Cavellian and Wittgensteinian approach is very much about imagining very specific occasions in which we might yeah. say, X or Y, and therefore, uh, you know, therefore, you know, turning methodologically away from having a kind of general theory of attunement or lack of attunement. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But I want to say uh, uh, just a quick thing about. I mean, uh, it's. I think it's. It, people usually tend to think of, for instance, Wittgenstein's investigations in terms of method that he presents a new method for us. Now, of course, that's in a certain sense, of course, true. I mean, there's all kinds of, I gather, new methods. But I think that there's also this, I mean, and this goes quite deep, not only to skeptics, but but I gather to philosophy as something in the spirit of philosophy in which we place a lot of hope in, in finding, as it were, methods of result of how to, you know, how to come close to to, to truth or to meaning or whatever. And it seems to me that, that of course, in a certain sense, that's true, but, but method is always in, in that sense, uh, the truth of a method presupposes, as it were, your ethical existential relation, that, that you really, you're in a good spirit, that, that you are this, that you have the goodness in order to, to find the truth. And I think, I mean, the Plato's uh, cave, uh, analogy i mean if, if you remember i mean the last thing to be seen when in the ascending to towards being itself is not truth or beauty but the good and plato says it's the good that makes the truth true and the beautiful beautiful because it's only in your goodness that you can as it were really want to see the truth so the truth is truth cannot be anything without your willingness to truth so i would i mean in this sense I, for me at least i think that the question of the will or the good will is, of course, essential for philosophy in itself. I mean, in Kant or in in all philosophies, and there's always this, as it were, impasse or a dead end, in the hope in which philosophy could pose to the methods of attaining truth, because somehow that uh, that task is already in itself an ethical task. So, so this was just kind of. Uh, Side note. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Nicholas. Now, Sandra. Thank you. Thank you, Victor. And thank you both because these uh, two papers were really wonderful in their approach of the ordinary and on the fact that there's no definition and that it's uh, something you called um, you know, as a moving target. Uh, and also the the, everything you say, uh, Niklas, about uh, it is, um, you know, a place, a, a return to uh, a place I have never been. Actually, I, this is something Caver says, and I really like this, uh, this, uh, this definition of, of the ordinary. And I think then the, this idea of a return is really where uh, the skepticism finds uh, itself. Uh, after um, the claim of reason uh, and uh, this whole uh, vulnerability of language and of voice that is connected to this redefinition of skepticism. Uh, I think this uh, and the uncanniness of the ordinary, I think this is something both papers show uh, really well. I just had a question um, about um, because you all mentioned a lot and, and Stephen too, uh, part four of the claim of reason. I think that uh, the whole uh, discussion in a pitch of philosophy also, uh, which uh, you both mentioned, is really, is really important. And uh, also the discussion about Derrida, even if it's not uh, uh, totally, I mean, it's not my, my favorite subject, but I think it's really relevant there about the return <laughs> to uh, a place there is no return because I think this is what makes the thing difficult. So I had a quotation, I sent it in the, um, from a picture of philosophy because 
I think there is a kind of radicalization in the picture of philosophy of what is said in the claim of reason part four, which is already totally, uh, totally uh, radical. And I think uh, this idea uh, that there is no uh, going back except uh, with uh, the fact, and this is a passage I think you uh, mentioned, uh, Niklas, about the, um, the voice and uh, again, the fact that it always finds uh, its way back to me. So I think, so uh, sorry, I, I put it again in the, <laughs> I'm always using quotation, but I just uh, want to ask you uh, also because it was in your paper, Niklas, uh, the connection between, you know, return and going back to, uh, to either to a place uh, you've never been or actually, uh, to uh, me, uh, to you, to um, yourself and the connection uh, between this return and uh, death, I mean, this, uh, which is something uh, that is uh, connected to this whole idea of returning to, uh, to, to this place, just to, so it's just a way to, to mention this, uh, these passages of, um, uh, for chapter two of a picture of philosophy because they are very relevant for both uh, papers. Well, yeah, well, like I can say, I mean, I mean, um, my in, in, initial plan was to say, to, to give a more kind of a, a gather a, a broader uh, mm. or kind of place this, this movement of return as as essential for, I mean, as a, as a kind of a basic uh, movement of thought or basic movement of the spirit in, mm -hmm. in philosophy and theology, uh, likewise. I mean, the turn, I mean, yeah, the whole yeah. idea, I think you can read uh, the same, at, at least structural uh, idea here uh, in, in Cavell's notion of returning to the everyday as a return to, I mean, the theological idea of returning to to God somehow, I mean, because there's, there is this question of, of truth or returning to the real somehow. I mean, there is, these are uh, somehow, I gather, inescapable themes. Uh, and, and I and gather that this is, uh, mm, and of course, Hegel has, uh, has thematized this in, in many ways. And, we, and, and there's, uh, and I think you find it in Plato and, and Augustine mm -hmm. and Descartes and all of this. So, so the, the whole notion of returning and, and, and I gather that there is this, this uh, I mean, the interesting question here, which has always been the, I mean, the core problem of theology in many ways that why, uh, why is it necessary somehow to be, as it were, alienated or somehow ripped from, from where you're supposed to come back to? And if there is this kind of, uh, so what's the necessity of that, uh, of that movement uh, in a kind of absolute sense uh, so, so I get it. I mean, and, and there I think, uh, and, and that's where I play somehow what I call here the desire as, as, a, as a way of, of not seeing it as a returning, but as a, as a certain kind of mm -hmm. continuous process of becoming or, or a process of, of creation itself, if you want to put it in, in uh, theological terms. I mean, that there is that the process of creation in itself is not something that, uh, I mean, the whole way in which we picture that there's this uh, beginning, which somehow was infinite, is in, a, in the infinite past, and then we have a end point. Uh, but, rather, but rather that, because of course, the idea of God being infinite, somehow then you have to understand it, I gather, I mean, I would say it more as understanding it as as this that we're all the time participate and that the lives we live are already as it were part of this the whole movement of of god or the or, or the uh, universal spirit or whatever you call it. and this is exactly infinity in work mm -hmm. in, in our desires so so that that would be i mean a larger theme uh, and that's how i think the ret i mean the question of returning is of course in a certain sense paradoxical i mean it's it's yeah. a, and 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 I think importantly so also. Okay. So, Can well, I I'm not sure if I'm answering your question. I mean, this was just uh, free thank reference. Thank you. I'm not. Uh, thank you so much.
Can I just add one uh, yes, aspect? Yes, please. Which, which I, I, wanted, <laughs> I wanted to hear you about the connection. Oh, I, I, I'm okay. really, I wasn't thinking about that passage, but I really yeah. like the idea of uh, also, it's the moving paradox. target. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. The, the, the idea of the moving target has to do with this, yeah. what Nicola exactly. said, it's a paradox, yeah. returning to something that is not there to begin with. What I wanted to add is just that perhaps we can see in this discussion already the seed of Cavell's later, uh, you know, later points about perfectionism, because he basically mm -hmm. defines Emersonian perfectionism as yeah. this constant struggle to 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 okay. get to us an, an achieved but achievable self and it, there is no end so it's different from what he calls a religious perfectionism in in cities of words so that's i think an, uh, a dimension of cavell's work that has to do with our constitution of ourselves our relation with others and our relation with the world uh, there is something connecting all of these this points. So, but, but thank you for pointing out that, that passage. Thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you all. It's amazing we, we have managed to uh, respond to all questions, have a great discussion, and beat the time. This is the first time, <laughs> and I'm, I'm, I'm grateful to all of you for, for keeping your time and, and, and for the beautiful uh, presentations and papers. Um, before we, uh, we, we close, I, there's just a couple of reminders. Those of you have, who are registered, the link you have received, and this is a question everyone has asked as many times, is a season ticket, as it were. It will allow you to enter every session of the colloquium from now on. So don't worry about getting another link. And please do not share it, because we would like for everyone coming to be registered in a list so that we can keep in contact with them especially thinking about next year. So re registration is an important desideratum, as we as, as, as could say. Also, I hope that uh, we can bring together as many Cavellians and people that could be interested spread around the world as we can. So please help us uh, uh, okay. uh, advertise and, and uh, disseminate our, our work here. And uh, about the presentation papers, uh, these are available in a Google Doc folder to all those registered, but we're not giving them, we're only, only if you ask for them. So please, if you're interested in reading the papers before, uh, beforehand, just write us a note and we'll send you the, the link. Um, it, several of you have done that already, but I just wanted to, uh, everyone to know. And finally, please don't forget that our next session which will feature Juliette Floyd, who is here from Boston U, who will mm. be speaking of the pertinence of ordinary language in our digital age in her paper entitled Selves and Forms of Life in the Digital Age, a Philosophical, a philosophical Exploration of Paratgeist. And Sandra Loger, who, who is also here from La Sorbonne, who will talk about television in the digital age and its moral relevance under the light of Cavell's theory of film. Well, it's been a pleasure. I, I hope to see you again. It'll be a fascinating morning. Write it down in your calendar. You can't miss it and I encourage friends to come. <clears throat> see you next month then, Saturday, May 15th, 11 EST. Thanks for coming. Mm -hmm. Toodaloo. Bye, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you, Victor. Thank you.